Come in. This is uh, TNT SOS number 11, <clears throat> Troubles and Trials, Stumbling Blocks or Stepping Stone. I'll tell you this group. What we're going to do is we're going to go to page 51 in your book if you have it. Chapter 7, Common Afflictions. <clears throat> oh, yeah, while I think about it. <clears throat> Mary's on there, right, Kelly? Mary, I am sorry I haven't been answering in your texts. Seemed like every time I'd get one, something would be going on. So I'll get with you soon. Um, all right, <clears throat> Common Afflictions, Chapter 7. <clears throat> now, we've already discussed at least four different areas where troubles and trials come from. And we've seen chastisement, we've seen the sufferings of Christ, we've seen God testing, and we've seen the devil tempting us. <clears throat> these, these can appear the same thing, and we'll get into that just a little bit later, but <clears throat> they can appear the same thing. But also there are some other categories, and those one of the other categories that I have <clears throat> is what I call common afflictions. And that is things that are common to all mankind. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, if you're rich or poor, or you know, if you're hidden away somewhere or not, you're going to experience some kind of troubles and trials. It's just, the, it's just the way it is in life. I can't remember where the scripture is offhand, but there's a scripture that says that he lets his rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, you would sort of have to if you were God. It's like if he's going to make it rain, you couldn't have little places where it rained only on bad people. And you know what I mean? <clears throat> and <clears throat> so, um, and so I guess by quoting that, the Lord is saying to us that um, there are common, let's just say it like this, common storms that come our way. There are common storms that come to all people. Um, and these, what I call common afflictions, they're not in the category of the things we've covered. They're, it's not God punishing you because you were disobedient or, or you are going through this simply because you're so holy and with the Lord. These are things that are clearly just, uh, I can't think of a better word than storms. <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> that's a problem for some people because they think that any storm, any trouble, any trial is the devil attacking them. And that's just not true. It's just not true. Um, Probably, this is just me talking now, probably the greatest afflictor of all is God because he wants you in the image of Christ. Okay. So he will work with you and he will bring about incredible circumstances to get our, just to get our attention, much less to get us conformed to the image of Christ. And, um, and of course, all of that is in his grace. But... If we, one of the reasons why I wrote this book and started having this class was because I saw that many Christians, I would say the majority, seemed to not know that there was a difference and that they couldn't read anything other than either this is, this is the devil or this is bad, you know, <clears throat> and that's all they got out of it. That's all they got out of it. Um... So, you look in the scriptures and you see, <clears throat> you see people handling trials and things like that. And some handle it well and some don't handle them so well. Um, when I was in Bible school, I remember this very clearly, that, you know, I'm... I was, I didn't know, 
prior to going to Bible school, I had been given the party line that everything was pretty much the devil. But then I was being taught things like, well, your old nature can do things and then you reap what you sow or you, um, God is dealing with you or um, your soul is just out of control right now or, you know, and it was all of this stuff and I was just, I was really, really confused and trying to figure it out. And the way I handled it then, now I've come to a little better knowledge, but the way I handled it then was that I I just said, you know what? I'm dead with Christ. I'm dead, okay? It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you know, God is not trying to fix a dead man. He's going to work on me. The Father will be faithful to bring me into this thing. And so I'm not going to react negatively uh, in, in that sense, if you can put it like that. <clears throat> uh, and, that. and the example that comes to my mind, of course, is the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And when they came out of Egypt, man, I mean, they sang the song of redemption when they got across the water and they turned to go into the wilderness and everything went bad. You know, I mean, every, everything that happened... Uh, one of the first ones was, I think, they ran out of water at Mara, and they were all griping and going, we're going to return to Egypt and all this stuff. And it was all meant to be a picture of Christ and him crucified. Moses takes the tree, and he applies it, and, you know, and another time he takes a rock, and Jesus is the rock, and he is smitten. Though he's a rock, and though he is stronger than all this other stuff that's around there, he breaks giving himself and water gushes out to to free everyone else and to take care of everyone else well boy that kind of situation isn't even god or the devil or anybody else dealing with you in the sense of you it's god dealing with you about his son about christ and about Seeing, in those examples, seeing in parable form or in a picture form, seeing Christ beyond just uh, a big Santa Claus or one who, he only exists for one purpose, to make us happy on earth. You know, that's it. It's like, yeah, I put you on earth, it's bad down there. But don't worry, I'm going to just run behind you and make you happy all the time, happy, happy, happy. Well, that situation at Mara where they didn't have any water was trying to show them their emptiness. He was trying to show them, I gave you the ability to have thirst, (laughs) you know. And, um, And then his whole example moves into... The cross over and over and over throughout throughout the wilderness. You know, um, they sin. They sin against uh, the high priest, and you know the Lord says, you know, okay, we'll take you know all you guys that think you ought to be a priest. You take a rod, take your rod that represents your tribe, and <clears throat> you lay it up before the Lord. And Aaron, you do the same thing. And his Budded, but it was dead. I mean, his, it represents Christ, the high priest, our high priest. And it's dead. It's lifeless. It's just a rod. It's been a rod that you walk. You know, they call it, what do you call it in, in Ireland? A shillelagh. Uh, you know, it, it, but the dead was resurrected, and it didn't just show life. It brought forth fruit. You know, and you're just going... Oh, my God, life must come out of death, not out of being a big shot priest. You see what I'm saying? I mean, because we think that's it. Well, okay, I'll become a minister. I'll become this. I'll become a missionary. And in being that, not in giving my life, not in laying down my life, but in taking the title or getting involved with the ministry, life is going to come forth. Well, you know. Let's not mistake um, God touching you 
with life. Because Jesus walked, before he died, before there was a death, he walked for three and a half years. And he touched people, and they still didn't have his life. And most of them still weren't born again. And if they died, that was it. So Jesus says, I must accept. I do this, except I fall into the ground and die. There's going to be no more like me. And there's going to be no branches to hold my life and, and this sort of thing. So you really, I mean, you look at all, you could say it like this. You look at the Old Testament stories, and I mean, everything from David, Goliath, all the way through, it is screaming Christ and him crucified. But we don't see it. We just see simple Bible stories. Or, and the moral of the story is that we should have faith. And, you know, and he's trying to communicate Christ, not that you, you know, that you pick up and feel stronger. And that's what happened when he walked the earth. They picked up and felt stronger. They were healed. They were you know, I mean, we go, my God, he raised Lazarus. You know, eventually Lazarus died again. Did you know that? And in that death, you better have Christ as life, you know. So, and in no way is any of that, at least from my heart, meant to belittle God touching us. Thank God. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today if God hadn't touched me so many times. But there came a day that the Spirit's dealing was different with me. And that day began to change my focus from seeking a Jesus of the Gospels and trying to lay hold of the one who died and rose again. You can know the Jesus of the Gospels, and you're not going to figure, you are not going to figure out at Mara when they didn't have any water, and, you know, there was a, <laughs> Moses took his rod and, and broke that rock. You're not going to see Jesus in that story, or in the, you know, on and on and on. You're not going to see Christ crucified, that Jesus. Uh, I mean, you're, not, you're going to see Christ crucified in those things, but you're not going to see the Jesus of the Gospels in those examples. You won't see him there because that's not him. In other words, that story of, at Mara and all of these other ones are declaring Christ crucified. And if you're still following Jesus of the Gospels, what I call Jesus of Nazareth, You'll never see Jesus in those stories. The best you can hope for is that somehow that encourages you that God will show up when you're dying of thirst. Okay, well, that's a good thing, but it's not a God thing in the sense of it's not his, it's not his best. It's not, you know, it's not the ultimate of what eternity is. It's what God can do in time and in space. <clears throat> All right, so... I think of, and we've talked about this before, actions <clears throat> and reactions. Um, I appreciated uh, something Kim shared with me. She's, uh, she's talking about being in this class and some of the other classes that she'd been in when she was here a couple of years ago. You don't mind me telling this, do you? Because they've all, they've, they're, some are doing it right now and they'll experience the same thing. So she's at Mallory's this time around, and she's listening to a certain class, and the Lord's really showing her stuff. And she's going, oh, this is, oh my God. She's really getting the Lord out, and all of a sudden she hears her voice in that class. <laughs> and she goes, oh my God, I didn't get any of it. <laughs> and I, that's what I told her, I said, yeah. You know, you are not the only one who's done that. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 
Amen. Mallory said that's happened to her when she taught the class. <clears throat> well, I, you know, I have picked up stuff that I have had written a long, long, long time ago and read it, and, and I thought, man, this guy really knows the Lord because <laughs> I don't remember seeing all that. <laughs> I don't know who this guy is, but it ain't me. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, that's the truth, isn't it? Isn't it really... Um, we say it that it's not in the classes and it's not going to come by me or Mallory or some, anyone else teaching. <clears throat> it comes by the revelation of Christ. And Paul always labels it the revelation in that sense, you know. The gospel I preached was not a man, but by the revelation of Christ. And there are many revel God can reveal all sorts of stuff. But the revelation is to reveal his son in you. And, and that's the true revelation because that is what Jews never had. They never could go through the veil. Revelation means unveiling. That's the literal meaning. So when Jews said it, they said unveiling, you know. And the Jews could never go behind that veil. And who was behind there? Well, it was the Lord. And that same Lord that was behind that veil delivered them and did miracles for them and did all sorts of things for Israel. I mean, that's one thing they were never deficient in was God would, would deliver them over and over. And let's face it, you don't have to deliver somebody over and over if they're dead. Right? <clears throat> so they weren't getting it they weren't getting it and to get it is to approach that veil and god at the cross rents it tears it open and there you see the lord for what he really is <clears throat> anyway i don't want to talk too much about that because in my newsletter now this <laughs> this newsletter is going to Oh, my God. We're probably going to get to part five or six because I'm just sitting with the Lord, and he's just, you know, he's just sharing. All right. So, but in these troubles and trials that come our way, um, the Lord, it's how we, we deal with that because a lot of times, even though we've been in these classes and we hear this kind of stuff, folks, I bet you there's a whole bunch of you in this class that when – Something just like what we say out of the blue or just, you know, unexpectedly comes up, some drastic thing that we, our first reaction is, our first action is to react, is to go, oh, my God, you know, and, and start freaking out. <clears throat> and you do have examples like Joshua and Caleb as opposed to all the children of Israel where... <clears throat> All these things were happening, and they were always freaking out, and they were always going, you know, I want to go back to Egypt. I, we were happier in Egypt. You know, you know what? You, you might have been happier there, but you can never go back to Egypt. Even if you do, you'll be miserable, you know. It's, it, the way the Lord showed me is it's the, it is the epitome of being a fence rider. Egypt is on one side of the fence, and the Lord's on the other side of the fence, and you're just sitting there going, you know, it's like you'll turn this way and lean this way towards the Lord sometimes, and then you'll lean back towards Egypt sometimes, you know. And as long as you're a fence rider, you'll never be happy either place. That's the problem with that. You can never make your home either place. And <clears throat> so they get to the promised land, and... They go in and they bring back all of this incredible, oversized fruit. Well, that's impressive. That's what most people see. What they really brought back, folks, was a big old branch that was having this big, heavy fruit. And we're supposed to be branches, see. And 
you know, that's the story behind this, not just, oh, look at the fruit that he was producing without us. And we just came in and got it. Rather, this is what you can live as. You can live as a branch. And when Jesus is saying all that stuff, he's in this, he, G, you know, I am the vine, you're the branch. He's not just kind of going, oh, I need to talk to you all about spiritual truth. Let's say, oh, hey, I, I am the vine and you're the branch. He's got all of this history throughout the Old and New Testament, all of this history of how they didn't get it and they didn't see it and they didn't grasp the magnitude of this branch and all of this fruit came from being in there and all of this can happen in you. You don't have to freak out at every bad thing that happens. You can actually see the Lord in it. But they don't get it. All that, you know what they got? They didn't even see how big the fruit was. They saw how big the giants were. Yeah. You know, right. It's like, oh, we can't go in there. The giants, you know, they're, they're big. We're, we were like grasshoppers before them. You know, well, that's a polite thing. You ought to see what you are before God when you act this way. <laughs> a stench in the nostrils of God because you're, you're, you're just not, you're, your heart is not with the Lord. You're wanting him to rush in and baby your flesh and pet your flesh. You're wanting, you know, you're wanting that to be your God. That's the kind of God you want. That's the kind of God you say, that's the kind of God I signed up for. <laughs> so and and every one of us knows that for a, a good while he does that stuff but there comes a day when he says okay I want to deal with you now as sons no longer as children <clears throat> and um, you know I mean the son doesn't drive up in the in the pickup with the wife and the kids you know and he comes in and says hey dad can I have one of them you know, suckers that you used to give me when I was three or whatever, you know. Dad goes, no, I got a, a big limb down here in the back and I need you to come help me move that. And if, what if he goes, I don't want to do that, you know. You do it. Sure, you're 65, but you do it, you know. <laughs> well, the father, he's not going to change his mind. He will not change. Once he determines that it's time for you to grow up, he's going to start bringing it, you know. Yes. And all of, so, so then all we're seeing is, why is all this stuff happening all of a sudden? I mean, that's how we see it. It's just like, you know, I don't, this is, I haven't, I don't think I've sinned, and it doesn't feel like the devil, and why is this happening? See, and we just can't read, we don't read anything. You know, Jesus said something about that. You can read the sky when it's red and luring, then you know that, you know, da-da-da-da, but he said, you can't read this time when I'm here, when, when I have come. A greater than all else is here. We miss the greater than all else, fiddling with the shadows and the, and the lessers and all of that, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> all right, well, so in that situation where they're at Kadesh Barney and they bring back the, the fruit of the land on a big branch, they, they, they're not seeing the abundance. This is a token, this branch and the size of this fruit is a token of the fullness just right over there. And they're going, well, but there's giants. You know, it might cost us. You know, it might be difficult. You know, I often think of, David talks about eating honey from the rock, you know, and that those bees are pretty smart. You know, you'd have a wall a uh, rock wall facing there uh, of a cliff or something, and they would, if 
find a, they'd have a little hole up there and they'd build their nest and for years and years they would make all this honey and stuff and it would just be the best honey untouched and everything and and David talked about oh I like eating honey from the rock you know but if you're going to climb that the first mo movements you start making climbing towards that bzz, bzz, and the further you go, the more you begin to get stung. And I've had so many people say, well, this, is just, this isn't worth it. Oh, my God. Okay. I respect you as a person and your opinion, but it's just hard for me to stand here and listen to you say Jesus isn't worth it. Okay. You know. So I'm being as kind as I know here. But my Lord, what is it that's more, you know? So anyway, the closer you get, and then you get up there. And remember in the scriptures it says of Jonathan when he ate it, his eyes brightened. You know, you begin to see, you begin to see, hey, now is the reward. I finally see. Oh, it cost me a little bit, and I got stung, you know. But I mean, you know. Once you see, you see, you know what I mean? You can't unsee. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. You can't unsee the Lord if you've seen the Lord. <clears throat> and those whelps and things will go away, but the, the seeing will not go away. All right. So, again, Joshua and Caleb are standing there, and these guys are all going on and on about the giants. And, you know, um, we don't think this is a good course of action to go into, you know, to this situation because we've talked it over and we think this is bad for our kids. Oh boy, not the thing to say to the Lord. It's not good to make your kids an excuse for doing, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's not. It's not good. And, and the Lord doesn't forget that stuff because he knows that it's just an excuse for not going in. Well, we're, we're protecting our children. No, you're not. You're protecting your own flesh. This is about you. So what happens? All of that generation that made that excuse about their children died in the wilderness. And those children, they came in. <laughs> you know, well, well I'm going to protect you so you don't. And the kids are thinking when they're finally going in, our parents tried to protect us from going in all the way for the Lord. I'm, I'm sorry, but many a child has said this about their parents. What idiot! <laughs> you know, huh? I'm going for God. I'm going for Jesus. And I'm putting him first. And I'm not going to let anything stand in my way. So, probably not, but I'll just say, I think I see a little smile on his face as he looks down at that generation going in. The generation of the ones we're overprotective for and yet they're crossing not just the Jordan, but the Jordan at the time of the rains when it's over flooding its banks. And it's, it, that's what it says. I and mean, it's impossible. This is, it was hard enough before, you know. And of course, people always make those crazy remarks, you know. You know, the, I heard the one, this guy said, I was telling him about the Red Sea crossing, and he said, yeah, but it had been real, a lack of rain for, years during that year and the the what the red sea was only uh like a, a foot deep and i said that's even a greater miracle than i even thought he drowned the whole army of pharaoh in a foot of water <laughs> So Joshua and Caleb go, they still the crowd, and they say, we are well able to overcome. But what did they preface that with? 
if God be with us, and we, we understand that to mean if God be in us, if we be a branch, if we be like that that came out of there, let's go in. Because out here, we're not a branch, but in there we'll be a branch and his abundance will flow through us. So whatever we're fearing out here, we won't if we enter in. Because it won't apply anymore. You see that? And that's, so Joshua and Caleb are going, hey man, I'm telling you, this is, this is the blessing of the Lord. And then they said, didn't you hear us? There's giants. And Caleb said, they are bread for us. Right. All right, now there's, there's your key right there. Troubles and trials. Yeah. It can be bread for you. In other words, a stepping stone. It can be bread if, you're, if your focus is right, if your heart is right, if you're, you know. It, all of us have fears. All of us, it is innate in human being, common to humanity. It depends on where your focus is. Seriously, it depends on where your focus is. You know, uh, any of you, have you, any of you ever walked like on a, a railing, you know, where maybe the cars pulled up to and it was about this tall and you're walking on it and you're, the only way you could really stay without falling, because it was a little thin, you're going like this, is you just focus where your feet were going. You didn't look at either side, you know what I mean? And, that, and so you go, okay. You know, so you're not seeing the problem. You're seeing what is there. You're seeing what's before you. You're seeing, you're, as it were, you're living with the Lord now in this situation you're not and here's the common christianity i got to get god in this situation well no he's already in that situation whatever that trial is he wants you to focus on him be with him now you know we get overwhelmed we get oh well there's this and there's that and there's this you know and <clears throat> i've i've used the same example for years but <clears throat> uh you know we used to make really long trips, you know, into Mexico and stuff. And, you know, we'd drive down in a van load of people. And, uh, you know, I, it would be like, for me, it would be such a long trip and everything. So I sort of figured out that, you know, somebody said, well, you know, so you make that long drive. This is years ago when I used to do it a lot more. You make that long drive a lot, huh, down to Laredo or beyond. I said, no, no, I drive to Waco. Really? Yeah. I said, and then after that, I drive to Austin. And then I drive to San Antonio. And then I'll drive to Laredo. And then I'll drive to Monterey. In other words, I'm not driving from here to Monterey. It's too much for me. You know, and some people get mad at me. They say, uh, well, what do you got going on next week? I don't know. Seriously, I mean, I... I I order it where this comes, and then the, I don't order it where I'm, you know, a, a passel of Indians surround me and all start shooting arrows at me, you know what I mean? And, you know, there's sometimes that that happens, but the truth is most of life isn't a million things, you know. <clears throat> um, it is facing those things one at a time. Well, I'm talking about facing them in the Lord. I'm talking about being with the Lord because the Lord is with you. Well, getting that mental state is, is half the battle. We're always, you know, well, God couldn't be with me because I messed up. Sorry, he is. He hadn't left, you know. Every time you do something wrong, he doesn't go, that's it, I've had it, you know. He's still with you. And he still wants you to be with him, you know. So Joshua and Caleb, that's their, that's their deal. Okay. Look, this is no problem. You know, I've often read it as if they said, we may be grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants, but they're smaller than grasshoppers in the eyes of God. 
So why would we freak out when they're so much bigger than us if they're not much bigger than God? We would freak out because we are so used to relying on our own resources to get through things instead of the Lord, instead of his life. And so we see the giants and we go, this is bigger than me. We, I thought you, you were kind of supposed to approach everything as if everything is bigger than you and thank God you have Jesus. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that, you know, you, instead of trying to go through life through events that make you stronger, things that make you weaker, give more place for him and his strength and his life. And so, you know, there's not a lot of people that have that. They, they might even believe the theology of it. But there's not a lot of people that really, really hold that because you can tell by the way they freak out all the time. All right, well, we know the end result is that Joshua and Caleb, of that group, they were the only ones that went in, and their children, but I mean, of the people that, that didn't see the Lord. All right, so let's try, to, let's try to just see that as it really applies to us. <clears throat> what if there was this truth of being in Christ that wasn't a truth at all. It was an eternal dynamo. It was an eternal powerhouse. Uh, it wasn't a teaching and it wasn't a doctrine. It was something that empowered the Apostle Paul and the many in the first century church and those that found it to be more than a teaching. So, there, so let's, say, let's just say there is this place called in the land, in Christ. And we stand outside of that land. And we look at the problems that face us. And we look at those in light of us, our ability to overcome. And... We are told by our Joshua's and Caleb's that we are well able to overcome, that we, once we step inside that land, we are not the same as what we were out here. And the fears that we have out here no longer are applicable because we will, out here, we're just us with a God that we can't see and we're not sure he's here. And in there, we're a branch and he lives in us and he courses through us, and he brings forth more abundance than we could ever do in ourselves. And so we're told, all right, you're given a choice then. You either, you either embrace that reality, which is God's plan. I mean, that's why he brought that. That's why he saved you. Can you, can you follow that? That's why he brought you out of Egypt. That's why he saved you. It was this moment he's brought you to this moment. And the choice is yours. Free will time is here. <laughs> and, uh, but here's, here's the deal. I've told, you know, our, our Joshua and Caleb will say, I've, we've told you the benefits of that. Now, if you don't see that, if you have unbelief concerning that, and you attempt to save yourself from something you think is so big there that once you're in there, it won't be near that big. God will take them down and did wipe them all. He did. He wiped out all the giants. <clears throat> um, then what you're going to be out here is you're going to be you. And you're still going to have God with you, right? Because the ark was still with them. You're still going to have God with you but not in you. In there, he's in you, and it's a real in you. It's not a, I'm a Christian, I got Jesus in me. You know. No, it's, it's Christ. And, and people may not be able to see and know that about you, but you know it about you because God revealed his son in you. 
And so, so you, you, you decide, I'm going to have unbelief toward that, but I'm going to still believe that God's with me in the ark. All right? So, without all the provision, and really, isn't that what it was called? It's a, it was not just called a land of promise. It was called a land of milk and honey. And it was called a land that floweth with, with abundance. and all. I mean, it was just all of this stuff that you don't have. No, we're going to go out in the wilderness. You know, we're, we're going to believe God is with us in the wilderness. We're not going to go back to Egypt because we're more holy than that. Okay. So we won't be found going back. So we're going to go into the driest, most empty, most unforgiving place called the wilderness, the desert. And there... We're going to do our best. All right. Well, they had unbelief, so they didn't believe any of what Joshua and Caleb said about what's in there and what will happen to them when they're in there. They didn't believe. Just no way. I don't believe that. Unbelief. They couldn't enter in because of unbelief. So what they did believe in did not deliver anything because if you, now this is something you ought to check out. You check out once they, I think it was once they got to Mount Sinai, all of the commandments, all of the blessings, all of the things that God promised, all of that was in the land. And it says it. You check it out. It says when you get to the land, then da 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 da. So they're not applying that to the land. They're applying that to themselves. They're not applying that to Christ and us being in union with him. They're applying it to, well, he loves me, and he's going to take care of me. And, you know, and, it's, you know, and, and so any, any direction I take, he's going to bless me. No, no. And it's not even a matter of blessing or not blessing. If you choose the land that flows with milk and, or if you have a choice between the land that flows with milk and honey and a totally unforgiving dry place that is meant to kill everybody that goes into it, <laughs> you'll find out. You'll find out. And you'll get mad at God because he's not Annie and up. Excuse my Texas Hold'em. You know, he's not anting up. He's not doing what he said. He said right here he would do da da da. And then somebody comes along and says, "And when you enter the land, didn't you ever see that?" And they go, oh, "I never saw that before. I just thought he was going to do that for me." You know, well, he is going to do that for you. But you in Christ, you in union with Christ, you with the f with excuse the way I put this, you with Mister Abundance. His name is Jesus. And if you don't have Mr. Abundance, then you pretty much have a box called the Ark of the Covenant. But for you, you're living in a little box of reality and truth that you're trying to hold on to God with. Well, when they finally, after delivering them from Egypt, after delivering them from Egypt, taking them through the wilderness, going, I'm talking about the Lord, the ark now, going through all that junk at Kadesh Barnea, 40 years round and round and round in the wilderness, when it finally comes time to really do the deal to enter in, the ark goes in first. goes in before him, and he not only goes in before him, he does what he does. The priests, four of them, holding that box that was at that point just been a box for him, goes down into the Jordan River and stops right there. And the waters roll back for the box that is more than a box. And now... The way is made. Come on. You were scared. You were doubting. 
you know, or your parents were. And now the ark is in first and he's holding your place. He's saying, come on in. This is, this is the sign. Okay. Well, all that wandering, they never once said, hey, let's take the ark and see if he can get us in. <laughs> they just said, hey, maybe the ark will keep doing miracles out here in the wilderness and we'll last for 40 years in a place we should have died in a couple of weeks. And then we can, and then every Sabbath, we can go into our tent that's burning up like as if we live in Arizona. Oh, sorry. And, <laughs> and we can declare to God, or declare about God, he did another miracle. Everybody goes, yeah, you know, because he is the God of miracles. Yeah, and he is. There's nothing wrong with that, but not in the wilderness. There's no place that, you know, follow that ark into the Jordan and then into the land. All right, so, um, so these different trials, we, we, we can't read everything. You know, it says in Exodus that the, uh, what is it, Pharaoh and the, the, the guys that made them build the pyramids and make straw bricks for Pharaoh, it says the more that they persecuted and bad treated him, the more they multiplied. That's talking about growth. Growth. Okay. See, we go, the more this stuff hits me, the more I just want to quit God. No. I mean, you can react that way. You can be in the multitude or you can be a Joshua or Caleb. The more they were you know, we go, I can't live in this situation. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't live like this. Well, then die. Just die. Just go to the cross and see that you are dead with Christ and quit trying to live like this. And let Jesus live like he lives in that. And the more they do it to Jesus, the more he multiplies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, those are realities. It sounds like great preaching, which it is. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and I, and I, it is my belief that these things apply to even our own man-made trials. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. All right. I believe that, that you can sow a lot of bad seed and expect a bad harvest. Do you agree? Yeah. Amen. Okay. But I also believe, depending on where you are at spiritually, that he can either, um, what is it, recover the years that the canker worm hath eaten, um, or by his life cause you to live in abundance even in the worst of situations. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've often read of, of the different survivors of the Holocaust and they say, where is God now? And you know, their whole life had been surrounded religion. You know, where is God now? Betsy found God right there in the middle of it all and lived it. And it, you, you, how many of you have read that, the, what is it, The Hiding Place? Um, and when she died, the, the German people that, you know, the doctors in there, they said she had this glow and this beauty about her, you know? Well, that's a, that's a right kind of death. Do you understand what I mean by that? I'm not talking about you dying with a smile on your face. <laughs> I hope you're getting more out of this than that. <laughs> that there is, a, there is a way to enter into death, not just physical death, that is 
beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. And others will see that beauty. God said to Paul, to, no, sorry, God said to Saul of Tarsus, Saul, Saul, why kick you against the goads? Why are you fighting all of this? You're fighting me, you're, you know. And Saul of Tarsus thought he knew God and he didn't know him at all. Not really. Because he said, because Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul would have said, I've never persecuted you, Lord. I've only persecuted your body. You <laughs> get it? You know. So, <laughs> clearly the Spirit of God is wanting us to awaken more and more and more, awaken our hearts and to draw us out of, you know, this, we, we quote Jesus a lot. He says, you are in the world, but not of it. Yeah. yeah. No. So many Christians are in the world and of it and fighting it and trying to get God to fix the world, you know. Oh, Jesus, fix, you know. Now, we don't say fix the world. We'd go, well, that's stupid. He's not going to fix the world. He's going to as it were, take us out of it, right? I mean, you know, he's not, he's, he's going to grab a remnant and that's what's going on and da da da, da. He's not going to fix the world. But I want him to fix my little part of the world. Mm -hmm. See? And probably if I was the president, I would go, oh, fix this bigger part because it pertains to me. And if I was the ruler of the world, I'd go, oh, fix the world, you know, because it pertains to me. That's only reason why I, I fight against the word of God, fight against the Lord and his plan because it pertains to me. And the day that we see Christ revealed in us, we will see our death and we will see that these things are not stumbling blocks they are stepping stones and I am going to quit tripping over them <laughs> and I'm going to start walking over them <laughs> amen, amen. alright let's take a break